He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Yes, indeed. And according to my friend Zoom, we are live. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast with Dr. Philip Ovedia. I'm the talking hairdo, Jack Heald. And joining us today is a guy I didn't know existed uh, this time last week. And it, he shows up in my Twitter threads and somebody says, oh, you ought to have him on the show. And I went and checked out his YouTube channel. And I went, oh, my God. So I contacted Phil. I said, Phil. Get a hold of this guy. We need to have him on the show. And here we are, less than a week later. Nick Norwitz, it's really good to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So um, I know Dr. Ovedia has some questions about some of the research that you've done. I have some, qu some questions myself that run along this line. How in the world is somebody as young as you already as degreed? as you are my lord you have a phd from oxford yeah that was fun yeah he says offhand yeah in what um physiology anatomy and genetics was the department my particular phd was in um, brain metabolism and ketogenics i'm gonna ask you to use small words okay <laughs> Brain energy. Um, <laughs> I, I'm with you so far, but I can tell this is going to get over my head in very little time. All right. So now you are uh, at, at Harvard working on your MD. Is that right? Yep. 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 So All right. So we've, we've established the fact that I'm in over my head. Phil, tell me I'll, why you were excited about having this guy on. I'll jump in and save you a little bit. So, you know, I've certainly been uh, following and interacting with Nick for uh, quite longer than a week um, and uh, really been, uh, you know, always um, impressed by the work that he is doing. And, um, you know, I've told Nick this, I think, directly and certainly commented on social media uh, that Nick uh, is one of the things that gives me hope about the future for the healthcare system. Because uh, uh, as you just mentioned, he is in the process of uh, going through medical school. And I think he is coming at it with a uh, very different mindset than most medical students. And a lot of that has to do with his personal background. Uh, so I think before we get uh, into all of that, maybe uh, this would be a good opportunity for Nick to uh, give us, uh, let the audience know about his history and how he kind of got uh, to where he is. Yeah, um, for sure. I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because um, my story can go on. But um, I was a very healthy, on the surface healthy, young person, young athlete. Um, throughout my childhood. By age 17, like I had no health problems to speak of. Didn't really get sick. You know, it was very athletic. I could run sub three hour marathons when I was 17. Um, I know what that couple, is. That's impressive. Stay push up records. Like I was super healthy uh, and athletic. And then things started to fall apart very quickly. Um, the first thing that happened is my bones started breaking more than one would expect even just, you know, it started with stress fractures because of the running, but my um, fracture threshold, the mileage I could run before I fractured just started dropping precipitously. It was like, year one, yeah, run 3,000 miles, no problem. Two years later, I can't do a 5K without breaking some bones. Um, so I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at age 20, which for the non-medical listeners, young man who's otherwise completely healthy, hormones normal, testosterone normal, thyroid normal, like BMI normal. That's weird. My TNZ score is negative 3.2 at the spine. What's so TNZ? I'll tell you how intense that is for a young young guy. What is that? Like, TNZ? 
um, the number of standard deviation, like I was in the bottom, I think 0.03% of the bone density. Whereas before I was oh, running quite, Lord. quite, um, I okay. think I'm not, I'm not a mathematician, but <laughs> I think that's correct. Um, and then, um, that was, that was surprising and sucky for me. Like it was just, that was a, uh, odd diagnosis to have. And it was really tough for me to think, you know, I'm not going to be able to run again. Um, but that was really only the beginning. It was at the end of um, my undergraduate time. I was at uh, uh, Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire. It was around the time when I was graduating. Um, my, I started having pretty severe gut problems. And I was someone who never, ever had any food uh, aversions, allergies. I ate everything in the kitchen sink. It was actually a point of pride with me that I would try anything. I really didn't have a EU reflex and I love to try things. But then I started to just not feel well after basically anything I ate. Long story short, I was developing ulcerative colitis, which is an inflammatory bowel disease. Um, if you don't mind me getting graphic for one minute, it's like ulcers open up in your stomach, you have bloody diarrhea, it's uncontrollable. And that became yeah. um, the dominant feature of my life. Um, trying to hide that, cope with it, you know, be a young guy, academician, um, social person while hiding all that. And it became extremely stressful. Um, but I was able to hide it until I, um, I went to Oxford. And what I want to say about that, that transition from college to Oxford, it was actually very coincidental. Um, because I, I always knew I wanted to go into medicine. I always wanted to be a doctor. And I had a very straight laced mindset about what I would do. And, you know, in terms of just a practicing physician, I had a lot of respect for the healthcare system. I thought I would just work in a hospital, do some research and, um, and ended up taking some time off, um, incidentally, just because of an opportunity that arose. So my senior year, I got, um, accepted to HMS and I got a scholarship just before that to go to the UK and study at Oxford. So HMS let me defer. And then instead of going straight into medical school, I went abroad. Now, I'll remind you, this was a time when I was, you know, at the beginning of developing colitis, which then got very severe. Um, after I, I moved to Oxford and I ended up um, having a few flares, losing a ton of weight, like 20% of my body weight, um, ended up a few times in the ICU with a heart rate in the 20s. My heart rate was literally in the 20s um, because it was the, the NHS. They didn't know where to put me. They ended up putting me in palliative care um, at one point in time. I'll never That's forget my mom keep him come till he dies, right? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't hospice, but it was. I was the youngest person there, probably by fifty or sixty years. Um, yeah. While I was there, I think a couple people died. There were people who were running around with dementia. I wasn't sleeping because the alarms would keep going off. You can't turn yeah. the alarm off if your heart rate goes into the twenties. And then I have like tubes in me, and it was wow. I did. It didn't really hit me until later how severe things were there at that time. But, um, I, um, I remember getting discharged under the most absurd, no, uh, um, uh, diagnosis of exclusion. They said I had turmeric poisoning that the curcumin <laughs> supplement, my GI doctor had recommended taking at a standard dose of 1.5 grams twice daily had made me bradycardic to the twenties. It was absurd. <laughs> And I knew it was absurd at the time. There was no way that that hypothesis held for many reasons, but I ended up leaving because at that point I was just incredibly hopeless and wanted to get out of there. So that was a practical matter. But I remember there after I was laying in my dorm wow. um, and just kind of taking stock of things. And this was actually, it just overlapped with my 23rd birthday. So I was in my dorm drinking a liquid vanilla shake supplement it was the only thing I could get down as like my birthday cake for my 23rd and thinking to myself, wow, I, I, I would have like, I have so much possibility in front of me. I, um, was, you know, valedictorian in my college. I have a place at Harvard medical school and I have a place to do a PhD at Oxford, but honestly, I don't have the energy to roll out of bed and I feel like I could die tomorrow. So there's a juxtaposition of what I could become and where I am right now. And also to just, you know, my, my physical being. So whereas two years ago, I could run a marathon in under three hours. Now I'm like, I literally like, it takes me energy to go to the bathroom, like get up and walk to go to the bathroom. I, I degenerated really quickly. Um, 
So then I did something that I, I guess I, I don't know, I didn't have the courage or stupidity, whatever, you know, word you want to use, description you want to use, do something that I hadn't done before, which is really take things into my own hands and start to experiment. Um, I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for all my doctors. Um, and the people I've worked for have been overall phenomenal. But I had this faith that the, you know, conventional medical system could heal, could, could heal me. Like, and it almost seemed arrogant to think that I could heal myself. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm, I haven't gone to school for, you know, many years to decades. So what do I know? I should follow the advice of people who do know, and they're going to steer me in the right direction. It's completely arrogant to think that I could figure this out. Um, but at that point, I was kind of hopeless, and I figured, you know, my options are, and this is going to sound, I wasn't, you know, I don't think I was depressed or suicidal or anything, but like just very practically speaking, my options are yeah. live a horrible life, die, or at least try to figure this out for myself. Yeah. And of those three, I feel like it's a pretty easy multiple choice question. <laughs> so, I just started to experiment with different things, lifestyle and dietary interventions. And I just ran the list. Um, and so I, you know, by the time I had tried a ketogenic diet, which is obviously the punchline of the story, I had tried every diet you can imagine, you name it, basically I've tried it. And when I say tried, I mean like when I tried something, it's very systematic and I give it a good go for like three weeks at least at minimum. Um, anyway, I ended up getting to, you know, the point on my list, ketogenic diet. It's like, ah, what the heck? This seems stupid. It's absurd. We know that this diet must be terrible for your heart and unhealthy. But honestly, at this point, I could die tomorrow. So who cares? Let me just try it. Wow. Wow. Um, and I tried it. And it was like a, you know, light bulb turned on. My mental clarity came back. I started having a lot more energy, even before any of my, like, lean mass came back. And, and my, um, my worst of my gut symptoms went away. And um, the bloody diarrhea just stopped. And at that point, I was actually um, home for a little bit, and I was about to go back to the UK, and I asked my GI doc, you know, doc, can I get a, uh, a CalPro, which is a marker for inflammation that you can get from the stool? And I had just gotten one week earlier, and it was high because I was inflamed. And he's like, I don't think we'd see it change this quickly, even if you had a decrease in inflammation. But you're going back to the UK. Let's get one before you go, just for the heck of it. We got it. And corresponding to my massive improvement in symptoms, my inflammatory markers dropped to their lowest level ever. They had dropped well over threefold and I was in the normal range. And since that time, I've never had to worry about an ulcerative colitis flare. I'm not how saying- long, How long did it, how long was it between the time you started and the-, the... A week, a week was, <laughs> I was feeling great after a week or comparatively great. Um, and, you know, there's been it bumps along the way, but basically since then, I haven't had to worry about being critically ill. Um, I've only had flare-like symptoms twice, and that was actually the three times. Twice when trying to reintroduce carbohydrates, I have reason to believe that ketosis is beneficial for me. And then once when I got a severe mold exposure and everybody was getting sick, so manifested in the GI stuff. But that, wow. you know, more or less, you can kind of intuit from that why I became interested and nutrition, although I'll say that after that experience, I thought I was just a one-off weirdo because I had a couple odd pathologies, like the osteoporosis in a young guy. That's weird. I tried a weird diet and had a weird response. That was my perspective. But right. it was interesting enough that I started to really delve into the science and um, then engage with the community around metabolic health and low carb. And you know, if I had a catchphrase or one thing I say over and over again, that makes me sound like a broken record is the most unique aspect of my story is that it's not unique at all. I see this motif now everywhere where someone's desperate. They're a little hopeless. They try this and it works. And then they become really passionate about it. And that's how the community builds. Um, so it made me interested enough that now, you know, I see it as my mission to, you know, be someone who pursues some of this research. And I found myself in a unique and privileged position to start trying to plant the seed of metabolic health in the next generation of doctors in my medical school. So um, that's where I am now. I, I yeah. was so impressed by that statement that what was unique 
about your situation was how not unique it was. Yeah. Sorry, Phil. And, I, I, that one that one really caught my ear when I heard that. No, and I was just going to say, you know, we've we've heard this story before from a uh, previous uh, guest. You know, a uh, young athlete, and you know, would would uh, appear to be, you know, in sort of optimal health, and things just start falling apart, and and you know, ulcerative colitis, and uh, you know, other things that show up, and and doctors usually just kind of throw their hands up um do you remember you know how you first came across the ketogenic diet yeah um it was actually you know you see it on the internet and you kind of like aware of it in your periphery um what ended up happening was my um my dad had gone to this um institute transform run by someone you may know dr vivian Lowe. Mm -hmm. recently become you know well, she's begun to some of the conferences and is a metabolic health doc. And um, it, the Transform Institute that she runs is a weight loss program. And my dad, you know, had a lot of success with her program, which is focused on, you know, low carb nutrition. He lost 50 pounds and he had struggled with obesity as, during his adult life and had been able to kept, keep it off. And he's like, you know, maybe Nick should talk to Vivian. And my mom and my dad, me look at my dad and I'm like, what? Because you think like, oh, this is a weight loss program. And right. I've never been able to gain weight in my life. It's been a joke in our family. Like my parents will literally like, not literally force feed me ice cream. My dad, when I was young, would go, used to go to like friendlies and, and he'd kind of goad me because I was very competitive. He's like, you can't eat that 12 person ice cream. And I'm like, watch me. And little 90 pound me would scarf down like a 12 person ice cream and not get any weight. So the idea of going to like a weight loss person is like, well, that's weird, especially when I'm dealing with colitis. But he's like, no, no, you'll like her. Um, cause you know, she thinks like me and we just, we just jive when we're talking about the metabolism and she was the first person. And I say this really not ironically, who gave me permission to try a ketogenic diet to be like, you know, this actually probably isn't the craziest of ideas. Whereas it's, you know, that what you hear in the media is, is a lot of, uh, negative things. And I'm like, you know what you jive with me, you make sense. And you're actually saying that this might make sense and help me out. Um, and so she, she planted the seed in, in my head and that's when I gave it, gave it a whirl. Uh, so, um, yeah. I'm what still just blown away by the, by, by the response in a week. Yeah. Well, that's what I was actually going to ask about next. What was your, uh, GI docs response to that, that, you know, um, that not only did you have this reaction that you, you know, uh, greatly improved your disease that, you know, most people just think is a chronic, you know, unrelenting, uh, progressive disease, but you did it in a week, um, you know, with a, you know, very well-established marker as your, uh, you know, test there. Uh, what was his reaction to that? Well, I'll just say that, um, he, you know, I, I've had a lot of physicians and now cultivated a very small medical team of people that I really admire and trust. And he's continues to be on that team. Remarkably brilliant researcher, thoughtful person, and very open-minded to, um, who found it, you know, I think, you know, like anything you approach it with skepticism, he's like, I don't think he's going to go out and recommend. I actually don't know. Maybe he is recommending ketogenic diet to other patients, but he was never off putting in any way. And when, uh, since then has always been supportive of my dietary experiments. And I've tried like even within keto experiment with everything from plant-based keto to fully carnivore. And even when you're like fully carnivore, which goes against all classical teachings, I'm very comfortable being open with him about it. And he's like, I, he's never once said anything negative. Um, he's given his two cents and I've continued to solicit it. Um, so we have a very good thing and I'm, I'm grateful for him, but um yeah, I think he's as any physician should be interested and just kind of, you know, I'm, I'm one more patient narrative in his memory bank. So I don't know how he interacts with the patients because of it, if it's influenced him or not, but I have nothing negative to say about it. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. And uh, that was kind of my curiosity, you know, certainly as a physician, you know, when you see something that remarkable, um, I would hope that it would, you know, 
at least prompt you to start thinking about it. And, you know, does this apply to other patients as well? Because um, going back to what you said, you know, what, what we tend to think of as unique usually isn't unique. Um, it's just that, uh, you know, maybe we personally haven't seen it before. I have to say related to that, it's bringing to mind, I, I found myself in an ethical conundrum a couple times since starting medical school where I've been in clinic um, and had patients come in to like a, you know, a, a primary care clinic with ulcerative colitis who have been suffering for years. And um, I'm there with, you know, an attending and, you know, being a, a medical student, it's not my place to give nutrition advice, especially to tell people to take, you know, start a ketogenic diet. And so I, you know, I've been told by people that I very much trust to like, you know, reel it in. And I do, <laughs> but it's really hard to sit there and see someone suffering and you have something that can potentially help them. Um, I just, but it's just not proper for me. I, I, I still, I, there are those nights when I like, I'll be sleeping. I'll not be able to sleep because I'm like, I, I can't believe I didn't tell somebody my story or, you know, that this could help them. But at the same time, I can't contradict the attending and I can't sneak out behind their back and, you know, whisper about ketogenic diet in the ear of their pick. It's just gonna, it's really hard for me to like hold back sometimes, but that's a lot of what I'm trying to do. So whatever you see on social media and research, that's me holding back. Give me a few years. Uh, huh. I'm out of that cocoon, but um, I think for now, you know, I, I do respect my superiors and I need to know my place, but it's sometimes hard, I'll tell you. Yeah, no, that's certainly a, a pretty challenging situation uh, for you as a medical student, uh, knowing this, but it also kind of talk, it, it kind of points out, you know, one of the uh, problems, I would say, one of the deficiencies, you know, in our uh, healthcare educational system in that, you know, it is very formulaic uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's all, um, you understand, there's a lot of information we need to learn, you know, in medical school and to, be, to become physicians, but um, much of what, you know, I now recognize in retrospect about my medical school training is that it's very much geared towards uh, group think and uh, just sort of, you know, following the following the guidelines, you know, and, and that wasn't even really a saying, you know, when I finished medical school, um, you know, it, the guidelines weren't as prominent as they are today. Uh, but it was still that mindset of, you know, kind of the cookbook, uh, follow the guidelines, even though we know that medicine isn't cookbook. Uh, and, uh, you know, each patient truly is unique. You know, that reminds me of something uh, that uh, our last guest was Dr. Nick Greiner and uh, Phil and Dr. Nick, I don't remember which one I'm with. I think, I think Dr. Dr. Ovedia said it, um, medicine is more art than science. And, you know, as somebody on the patient side of the thing, um, that gave me a lot of comfort because my, my frustration with my interactions with the all allopathic com community over the years has has fallen under that category of hey i'm not a number i'm a person i have these you're, you're not asking me anything that i think is important um and then i was just listening to a conversation between dr jordan peterson and dr ian mcgast where they were talking about um this at, literally at the neurological level, this conflict between the left and the right brain, conflict may be too strong a word, but how, how the, the left brain uh, is is the, the brain that abstracts everything and it, it's black and white, whereas the right brain is pattern recognition. And we can look at that as, as uh, it, it wouldn't be wrong to characterize it as logic or, or art versus reason or art versus science. Um, and it's fascinating to me to hear all these conversations start pulling all these things together that we're starting to recognize patterns that we may not necessarily have algorithms for. And yet, and yet the patterns are there. I'm not sure if I have a point that I was, but it just, I think, I think I, what I'm, what I'm hearing from you, and maybe I'm, I'm primed to hear this from you because of some of the research I've been doing with 
with others on lean mass hyperresponders. But if you have a patient that doesn't fit the pattern, you try to smash them into the algorithm one way or another. Yeah. And that's sometimes not the best thing for the patient. Um, so we, exactly. we have a few populations like that. And unfortunately, there's a paucity of, uh, or a deficiency, I'll say, of evidence, um, people being studied who are eating you know, different dietary patterns, which definitely influences certain metabolic health markers or, um, you know, patient, patient development narratives, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I know, I think when somebody doesn't quite fit the narrative that you have to kind of figure out a way to squeeze them into a schema that you've been learned. It's a lot harder to think about a whole new model. Um, it just is. I like so, how you said yeah. that, 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 that summarized my experience yeah and you know one of the things that we've been seeing is that you know uh, you you know you can maybe say okay there's one exception there's two exceptions uh you know and the rule still holds but you know as we're and we see this in lots of different areas of medicine uh but nutrition maybe is one of the most glaring examples of it is that now it seems that, you know, the majority of the population is an exception, and yet we still want to hold on to the rules, you know, uh, the, the, you know, that we think that the U.S. dietary guidelines are the, you know, the, the best uh, nutritional advice that we can give, and yet we are now at a point where, you know, more than half the population is sick, largely following these guidelines, and yet we still want to, you know, continue the narrative of the guidelines there's a huge philosophical conversation there that i would love to go down but i think it, it would not serve our guest well so <laughs> bill uh, so we were talk talking about, about yeah in trouble. yeah no we'll keep you out of trouble here but um, you know you don't get nick in trouble <laughs> You've certainly, uh, you know, brought a unique perspective, I think, to your medical school education. And, uh, you know, I'd love to get into the recent paper that, uh, you know, you were an author on uh, talking about a pretty unique program uh, that uh, you, you know, brought to your classmates. Sure. Um, the first thing I'll say is this, this, it's gotten a lot of chatter, I think, because social media was very primed on the topic of CGMs. You use the word program, it's generous. For those who do not understand, CGM is? Continuous glucose monitor. It's a little device you put on your body, your abdomen or your arm, and it'll just tell you what your blood sugar is, or I guess interstitial blood glucose, but let's simplify it to blood sugar. Um, Thank you. At any point in time. So you okay. can just put the app on your phone and it tracks, you know, how to exercise or you know, waking up or eating, of course, in fact, impact my blood sugar. Um, so it's a tool that was developed um, for people with diabetes, type one or type two, um, to help manage blood sugar, because those are diseases of either intolerance, you know, intolerance to carbohydrates. And um, more recently, people have been using them who are who don't have diabetes. Um, they've kind of entered uh, lay user territory. And that's decided a lot of controversy. But anyway, with respect to what we did, um, you know, I, I came in, as you now know, very interested in metabolic health and wanted to plant that seed in the mind of my peers. Um, turns out they basically did it for me. So over the beginning of um, medical school, there just was a lot of interest in general in metabolic health. So we kind of gravitated together formed a little nucleus that ended up just growing around interest in metabolic health. And I was percolating on, you know, how, how can we really engage people deeply with metabolism? Because I'm not in a position to restructure the curriculum, really develop a nutrition course and incorporate it. I, even if I had the time, I don't have the power. Um, and there isn't the space in the curriculum because it's just so jam packed. There's more medicine every day to learn and we have very little time to learn it. So, you know, if you're going to put medicine in, uh, nutrition in, you have to kick something else out. It's a zero sum game. But that doesn't mean there's not room to be creative. And obviously we all engage with nutrition either every day or almost every day if you do prolonged fasting. Um, so there's an opportunity there. And CGMs allow you 
an opportunity will give you the you know advantage of taking taking that opportunity and really grasping it because then you have people engaging more deeply with nutrition so i thought you know maybe this is something i could pull off if people are interested i could actually get cgms for students and we could use that as the core of a more expensive kind of i would call it metabolic health immersion program and so I kind of probed interest with some people, some friends, and they were like, yeah, that sounds really cool. Could we actually pull this off? And um, then, you know, I went to some faculty and they're like, wow, that seems really cool. You should try to pull this off. And so then put in the legwork, you know, partnered with the right people. Rob Sivis was our um, team physician, did the screenings, did the basic lab work um, on people. I, I went through the right channels, looked at the IRB, you know, we got an IRB exemption and then the school approved. The Sorry, program. IRB. Uh, um, a review board, basically ethics. Internal exam. review board. Okay. We just, we just, Make sure that ethically you're doing doesn't We did everything the above board. Standards. I wasn't being gotcha. renegade. I had a okay. lot of support from the, the community um, and did everything above board. And so, you know, that's what we did. We got continuous glu glucose monitors for students for medical education purposes. We trained them on them. Um, in, including how to interpret the glucose curves, you know, what affects it in terms of exercise and the cortisol awakening response and how different foods affect it and how, you know, a variation in glucose might not actually be a bad thing under these circumstances, X, Y, Z. And then we also had other elements of the project where, you know, we met for journal clubs, we had patient panels. The glucose monitor was the catalyst to get people excited about metabolic health and that made them want to do other things. So we would discuss, you know, primary literature in cell metabolism around CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, et cetera. Um, and so when we started this project, people were enjoying it so much and rumors started to go around that other students wanted to get involved um, to the point that we really couldn't supply the CGMs for which there was demand. Um, and we had to cap it. The core cohort, um, which is actually really hard to say if you try to say it five times fast, four, 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 four. Um, so it's not something. Um, I was asking, actually going to ask you the size of the core cohort, but it was, it was 13. And then we expanded to 40, um, people, uh, got, got the monitors and the feedback was fantastic at the end. Everybody either agreed or strongly agreed on the outtake survey with, um, statements like this enhanced my medical education. Um, you know, it was interesting and it will help me better serve patients. A lot of people are also, you know, adapting their health behaviors and we're becoming, I guess what you could say is quote, metabolically woke, where it's like, you know, we, we talk about how terrible the food environment is around us, especially in hospitals. And it's something that's very easy to overlook until you see it, until you really see it. And then you can't unsee it. So like, you know, if I go into a patient's room, and they have diabetes, their fasting blood sugar is over 200 and they're getting chocolate cake. That's absurd. It, like you don't need a degree to know that's absurd, but people don't see it. You put a CGM on them and then they see that they go to the cafeteria and they see, you know what, there probably shouldn't be pizza for breakfast and 20 different types of like croissant and Danish and bagel. And then like, you know, not really any healthy options. You can kind of, you know, go play like where is Waldo with the hard boiled eggs, maybe. But other than that, the food environment's pretty toxic and it just doesn't make any sense. And if you put some, you know, you, you pin someone down, ask a doctor, does this make sense, our food environment, what we feed patients, what we feed ourselves in the hospital and the culture around this, they'd say no. But it's very easy to just like let go from your mind. When you have a group of people together wearing continuous glucose monitors and talking about it, I think that's the start of changing the culture. And that's kind of what I saw a seed of as well in students who are like, well, this is absurd. This is, this says blank hospital. I'm not going to name the hospital healthy eats diabetes. It's a recipe. And I've posted this recipe to Twitter because it's open access on the hospital's website, healthy eats diabetes, sweet potato pancakes with all purpose flour, packed brown sugar, yams. It's 64 grams of sugar per, for, per four pancakes. And it's literally the recipe on the recipe card for diabetes at, you know, a world renowned hospital. I, I just, it doesn't make any sense once you see it, but you have to see it and you have to start discussing it <laughs> and have the culture be challenging it rather than having one renegade medical student just clapping his hands. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. I love that. You're bringing uh, a, a critical mass of pressure from the grassroots of the, the medical students. That's a psychologically sound approach. Yeah. And, and it, the thing is, it's not any like, it's not, I know we see on Twitter these extreme polls and these wars. There's yeah. no war. We all want patients to improve. And if you pin people down, this is, we all agree this is absurd. So everybody's supportive. Nobody's defensive. It's not about that. And it's not about me trying to convert people to keto. Like there, there were, of our core cohort, three vegetarians and a vegan. And they got on fine. We, like, it, was, it was great. It was one person that was low carb. That's not me because I recused myself as being a participant. We had a great diversity of interests and diets. And you can come together over the fact that feeding chocolate cake to someone with diabetes who's in the hospital just doesn't make sense. Like, we can agree on that. So. Well, we're all singing from the same sheet here. Yeah, yeah. Full disclosure, I got my uh, you know CGM on currently, but um, it's uh, it, you know I, I I love the approach because you're you know uh, first of all I'm stealing the term metabolically woke from you, um, but yeah, I love that know, one that you're influencing you know these future physicians who are then going to be you know influencing the scores of patients you know that they take care of. Um, and that's really how we start to get a change in the system, um, because you're right. I mean, it is absurd. And the reality is, is that probably, you know, if you asked, you know, you know, 90 percent of doctors would agree that it's absurd, you know, the food that we serve in the hospital. But, um, you know, most oh. just ignore it. You know, it, it, it doesn't even register. They don't even notice it. Uh, you know, I'm one. I mean, for instance, when I'm making rounds in the morning, um, you know, my my physician assistants at this point, you know, know what's coming. You know, if I walk in at breakfast time, and uh, you know, I'm just like, oh, what you got on the tray there? And I just have to like shake my head again. But uh, you know, it it's um, it really does kind of speak, uh, you know, just about the mindset uh, in the healthcare industry these days. So I'm I'm very encouraged. Uh, that that you, amongst others, are working to change that. Can I back up a little bit because there's some there's it was a question I had that's that's rooted in personal history. Um, I was talking to my mom last night about 1969, um, and I had reason to 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 ask her what was going on in our family in 1969 because that year has come up. And she reminded me that was the year that my dad had his colon removed because he had ulcerative colitis. Um, and of course, it was tre a tremendous upheaval in, in our family. He lived for 40, I don't know how many years. Uh, he was 31 when, he had, when, he, when it happened. He died at 77, however long that is, 46 years. He lived 46 years with a stoma bag, whatever. Um, and so this, my, when I heard your story about ulcerative colitis, I instantly thought back to my dad and his life. And, and I have, I've got to ask, do, do you have a thesis or, or even a pretty good idea of what the root cause of the ulcerative colitis is, or at least a thesis for why um, the, a ketogenic diet reversed it so quickly? I am a pro at speculation, which is all I can do on this topic. So I'll start high level and then start to bury, you know, delve in as deep as you want me to go. But um, um, let me first say, there are a lot of different things that can predispose you to developing an inflammatory bowel disease. And I had a lot of hits against me. So things like if you have IV antibiotics when you're a newborn, that increases your risk 500%. And I did because I had a fever as I was newborn. My parents didn't know that when they gave it to me and maybe I needed it because I had a bad fever, but you know, that's one hit. Um, being an Ashkenazi Jew, that's another hit. Um, so there's a genetic component to it. There probably okay. is a, a predisposition, a uh, genetic predisposition. My dad was not an Ashkenazi Jew. Jew so, but I, well, but... I mean, any, anybody can develop. <laughs> I mean, I think you, you wouldn't be surprised, you know, that I would strongly suspect a westernized diet 
contributes. In fact, if you look at the, you know, geography and epidemiology of, you know, where in the world inflammatory bowel diseases are distributed, it tracks very, very closely with where there's a westernized diet. Um, so, you know, and, I and, thought I was and eating- If you don't mind, would you define the, the key qualities of the westernized diet? I would say lots of processed food and refined carbohydrates. Okay. Those are really the highlights. Um, processed food, refined carbohydrates. And the funny thing about that is you can eat according to the guidelines and still eat a very westernized diet like I did. Because, you know, when I was growing up, I ate by the food pyramid before it turned to my plate. And I ate my five fruits and veggies per day. I filled all the checkpoints. I ate all my grains. I ate my fruits and veggies. I ate my lean meats. I got my, you know, you know, 1% milk or whatever. Um, And then everything on, on top of that was fine because it's just calories in calories out and I was active. So as long as I hit all my checkpoints, you know, I love fruit. I would eat piles of it in veg- vegetables um, and, mm. and get my, you know, my whole foods. And then I just get a bunch of junk because why the heck not? Sure. It's part of the culture and, and I can without, you know, gaining weight. So it, it didn't, didn't seem like an insult to me. I didn't manifest with uh, obesity. I did manifest, I think with um, colitis in the long term. Um, I think it would be very unlikely that if I had just eaten a like evolutionarily sound diet my whole life, I don't think I would have developed colitis, but that brings me to why maybe a ketogenic diet could be helpful. Um, or why sometimes people, this is a weird thing where not weird, but a lot of people find elimination diets like carnivore, even when they're not ketogenic per se can be helpful because you eliminate a lot. And that makes sense to me. I've actually found ketosis to be quite important to my gut health. The actual like metabolic state of ketosis, where if I eat too much protein, it can be an issue as well. So in me, and I don't mean to generalize this beyond me, but um, there is some basic science literature showing that ketone bodies themselves are very important for stem cells in the gut and for the gut lining to renew itself. Mm that they have anti-inflammatory properties. If they're signaling molecules, they have anti-inflammatory properties through inhibiting things like the NLRP3 inflammasome, which you might have heard of. Um, And then the way in which eating a higher fat diet changes, uh, this is a real rabbit hole that you're gonna have to stop me from going down with bile acid metabolism. Bile acids are thought to help us, you know, just digest fat, but they do so many other things and they themselves are signaling molecules. So there's some literature around that. So there's a lot of things I can think about, but I think, you know, one prong is removing things that are inflammatory, you know, just in general, the processed foods and then that sure. elimination aspect. And I think there's an actually an aspect of ketosis being beneficial as well. I have kind of this sixth sense, it's very bizarre, where I can tell you based on my gut symptoms at any given time, at any given morning, I should say, about my ketones are running. I was measuring my ketones every morning when I went on a ketogenic diet and um, it got to the point where like, before I measured, I'm like, my gut feels like this. I think I'm at like a 1.6 and I can be accurate within about 2.2 millimoles, which is, it's freaky, but I can do it. Um, I don't know if I can do it right now, but after tracking for a while, like I, I, I did have a sense for it. So, um, and it and, would not and, be an interesting carnival, uh, attraction. I'm sorry. It just, it's, 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 um, yeah, fascinating, so, but I don't think anybody'd pay money to see. I, I can't <laughs> tell you, I can't tell you why exactly it's therapeutic for me. I'm pretty convinced it is. I mean, it's a natural experiment. If I've tried to reintroduce carbohydrates and that's when I get issues, even when I'm, when I'm reintroducing carbohydrates, I don't eat ice cream. I'm having a sweet potato. Like it's still whole food that shouldn't necessarily be problematic, but also the fact that there are a lot of other people with inflammatory bowel disease. I think you might've even had one or two on your your podcast. Um, Also young men, my age athletes who go carnivore or keto and have improvements. Now my form of keto, just to to put it out there, it does vary time to time. So it's, it's hard to pin me down, but, um, For the majority of my time, it has been more, quote, Mediterranean style keto um, with a decent amount of vegetables, lots of fish, um, and not a ton of red meat. Although I've been like fully carnivore for five months as well. I have nothing against ribeyes and stuff. It's just where my 
taste predilections go, I would always just, I've always loved fish, things like olives and stuff. So that's what I like to eat. Um, so that's, my diet looks uncom, not uncom, well, not your typical Twitter idea of keto, bacon, butter, and eggs. It's not my taste preference, quite honestly. I have nothing against it. But Has the your- tw- um- The Twitter- Keto diet, bacon, butter, and eggs. I like. Well, that. that's the Ken Ken's thing, right? That's, the three yeah. million bacon, butter, beef, bacon, butter, eggs. I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Has your um bacon has your bone health improved as well with all this? Yes. Um, I was on a medication for that, uh, denosumab. Well, first Forteo, then denosumab, just to be completely transparent. Like, I I have nothing against prescription medications properly prescribed. And this was something that I really advocated for aggressive therapy because I didn't want weak bones, especially at a time when it's critical to build up. So I went from Forteo to denosumab. Now I'm on a drug called Remosazumab, um, which is an anti-sclerostin antibody uh, just for the bone people out there. Um, be perfectly transparent. I have no problem being on bone meds. I will say one very interesting thing is um, my there's different types of bone. There's spongy bone, and then there's cortical bone. And the areas that are rich in this dense like shell cortical bone did not improve much on the medications, but did improve after I went keto. Um, that, it was, just, you know, I guess it really only a single time point. So I, I, I only introduced that, let's call it, let's call it a wash, to just note that my bone health didn't get worse on keto, which I think some people have speculated I it definitely didn't happen for me. And yeah, now my bones, I no longer have osteoporosis or osteopenia definitionally, and I haven't had fractures. I can't run because of actually a genetic condition. Um, I have a very, very rare gene mutation so that if I run the mechanical loading, the impact actually weakens the bones, or that's one of the thoughts, so a mutation in a gene called LRP5. I don't have to go into it, but Otherwise, I'd be running right now. So. Um, just because it, I, I, I don't, I don't understand the difference. What's an example of cortical bone versus a spongy bone? Um, well, like your femur, your your your, um, you know, leg Five. bone. The the shaft of it will be like you know, it's like hard shell. It looks like, I mean, it, it's it's very dense. Uh-huh. Whereas the spongy trabecular bone is more like your spine will have a little bit more of that. And it look, it literally looks kind of spongy on imaging. Um, Dr. Avedia might be able to describe it better, but yeah, this one that's very, you know, dense and shell like like your skull. Yeah. More protein, probably more protein matrix, uh, you know, in the cortical bone. Uh, so um, just uh, interesting. It, it you know, it, you just start to wonder, um, again, how, you know, how might those two things be connected? You know, was your osteoporosis, you know, a earlier, uh, marker of, uh, the problems to come? Um, but- I, I never had a high HSCRP interestingly, and, um, which is a systemic marker of inflammation. So I don't know how much systemic inflammation there was from my, my gut early on. And, the manifestation was so much earlier on. I honestly think it was just a lightning hit twice thing. Um, we actually, uh, there's a case report on me about the mutation I have in my bones because it was that rare. Um, I was the first, yeah, well, we don't have to go into that, but, but there is some weirdness going on with that, I think. Okay, well, I, I want to ask, oh, so, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, also kind of get your thoughts on, you know, you've gotten involved uh, in, let's call it the citizen science movement. Um, and, you know, you've been author now on a couple of papers, or at least one, I think it's two, um, with uh, Dave Feldman and uh, and uh, Siobhan. Um, and, um, you know, many, uh, again, you know, many of the... Uh, I guess, traditionalists, let's say, in the healthcare system would look down upon that and say, you know, what are these non-scientists, you know, uh, trying to do science? Um, Excuse and, me, I've written 26 <laughs> papers and I have a PhD. No, no, I meant, you know, you're associating with, uh, you know, guys like Dave and this, 
certainly I don't view it this way, but I'm sure many have. So um, I guess talk a little bit about, you know, your thoughts around, uh, you know, the contributions that uh, those outside the traditional system, let's say, can can make to science and how that's uh, been working out. I don't think I'm going to say anything that you or anybody listening to this doesn't think science, you know, training can be helpful in the bureaucracy of science and writing papers, knowing how to get through IRB processes, design trials, do the proper ethics, all that. But the scientific process is just being curious and challenging your hypotheses. It's something we're born doing as babies. It's baked into us. And someone like Dave, I have so much admiration for because it's, he lives it like he's so genuine about pursuing the research question, you know, without really, you know, ego involved and sacrificing for it. You people have no idea how much Dave has sacrificed for the pursuit of what he's doing and how genuinely he cares about this question and the people who are affected by the question he's asking. And, you know, I'm in good company. Yes, Dave's an outsider, but now he has the ear of professors at Harvard and Stanford and all over the world because he had a good idea and they see the merit in his idea. So I have absolutely no trouble associating with him. I'm proud to associate with him. And I think it's really exciting to work with him because we have complementary expertise that have shown through and in, in me being able to support his work and him being able to, you know, incorporate me into his team. And, you know, you mentioned we have had three papers this far, four papers, four papers. We had a lean mass hyperresponder cohort study with case series, a case study on lean mass hyperresponder eating a low saturated fat diet, um, the N equals one duplicate that came out in current opinions recently, and then the lipid energy model. Four papers, I can tell you there's a couple more in production. Um, and, and, and things are just kind of kind of start to scale up. So we're, 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 you know, if we're just done with phase one. Now we're getting into like properly going towards interventional trials um including mechanistic work so i can't talk about that because i don't want to you know spill any beans from the team being involved but we're at the, the very beginning i mean all these papers have been published 2022 which on a research timeline is fast yeah, yeah. so 2023 2024 you're going to be hearing a lot more about this um this lean mass hyperresponder stuff i think it's utterly fascinating from a scientific point of view and i do not take it lightly by any means way, shape, or form. I, you know, obviously LDLs and the CGMs and LDL, the two like most explosive topics on social media, and I've managed to stick my feet in both of them. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the lean mass hyperresponder phenomenon of people who are lean and healthy, who go on low carb diets and see these skyrocketing LDL numbers, the quote, bad cholesterol. Scientifically, I'm fascinated. I am, you know, Dave's more, quote, cautiously optimistic than I am. I'm still like, you know, this is, this is freaky. I'm not, I have high LDL. I think a lot of people know that. I'm not on a statin for it, but I'm not like willy-nilly comfortable about it. And quite honestly, if I didn't have to be keto, yeah, I just need a sweet potato and lower my LDL. I've done experiments. And, and, and again, scientifically fascinating that I can fluctuate my LDL, my bad cholesterol between around 70, 75 and 500 with food. Like uh, in how long a doctor that it's, it's, you have no idea how unbelievably mind blowing that is. If you're not in medicine, just, just food in a short period. Yeah. Within 24, 48 hours. I mean, Dave's shown uh, it multiple a little bit times. longer than that. Wow. But within a week for sure. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's interesting. So, you know, with all that in mind, where do you see your uh, career headed? Uh, you know, when you finish school, what are, what what are you, what type of practice are you envisioning now? Well, I definitely don't see myself just being a standard hospital doc, but I want to do some clinical work. I think I will have a hospital affiliation because I love teaching, um, and um, and then ideally be associated, you know, be able to pursue research. So teach research and clinical work in what proportions, I'm not sure. Um, and, and exactly how it'll, it'll fall together. I'm not sure. I think it's so much has happened in the past couple of years. And to think that I have several more years of medical school and then residency, it's really, 
I can't predict what will happen. I think it'd be super cool to, to really get into um, scientific education for the populace that people like um, Andrew Huberman, I, I admire phenomenally for how it, the, you know, the breadth of people he's able to reach. So to do something like that, and like what you guys are doing is, is it'd be pretty cool. Uh, it's a little bit premature for me at this time, but um, I, I'd like to, to teach us that you guys might get the sense. It's pretty, I don't know how much time at this point. So like you, you were, you were commenting my YouTube the other day. Like I literally, as you can just tell, like I'll be walking like have a little time. I'll put the paper out, I'll read the paper. Then I'll just take out my iPhone, put it down. And like, let me blab about this paper for five minutes. That's the extent of what I have the time to do right now, but it's still fun. And um, you know, I, I, I like making science accessible to people. That means to me. Well, I can say this: the dishes that you had video of on the "Who Is Nick" uh, video were gorgeous, and um, I definitely want to eat them. So would... I have I have two questions: Did you make them yourself, and do you have uh, recipes? Um, I don't know if you're teeing me up for that. Um, I have made them myself, myself, there's not more than one of me, but, um, one of the things I did while I was doing my PhD at Oxford is, um, I became friends with this woman, Martina Slariova, who runs the, um, website, the keto diet app, and she's a, a keto chef. So we have a cookbook. Um, other co-authors are Thomas DeLauer and a friend of mine, Rohan Kashid, who um, ran a restaurant in Oxford. So we have a Mediterranean keto cookbook that's on Amazon. You can go What's it called? Name. The New Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. Um, the New Mediterranean Diet Cookbook. Okay, folks, that'll be in the show notes. Yeah. So um, keto-friendly Mediterranean diet. I kind of, the reason, my, my, my reason to take that route, other than the fact that it's what the publishers would bite at, is just to kind of break with the public narrative that keto is just beef, bacon, butter, and eggs. Nothing, there's anything wrong with that. But um, there's a stigma around keto within, you know, among conventionalists. Whereas if you can show them like, look, avocado and salmon and olives, it's also keto. Like there's lots of different ways to do this. It makes it more palpable. And it's kind of like a first step towards carbohydrate restriction for a lot of people, I find. So that's how I started before I would ever experiment with something like carnivore, which now I'm quite open-minded to. But it was fun. And um, yeah, you know, the, some photos, like I didn't realize what an art food photography is. Like we had a, I think it was, it was a 10 or 25,000 pound budget for our food photographer. <laughs> like it's a thing. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, I, I think the ones that are videos of, you can see me eating some food and, you know, making a mayo that I made, I can do a mayo, but like, you know, really well made food for that anyway. So well, the, 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 the pictures dishes of my looked... book are not taken on my iPhone. Okay. Well, the dishes looked fantastic. And, uh, I, I yeah. do I do ugly yummy or um, just sometimes ugly. I did learn today. <laughs> uh, I was in a rush for lunch. You can't microwave reheat chicken hearts because they have little air pockets in them, so they explode. Explode. Yeah, I should have thought about that. So yeah, I uh, was cleaning uh, chicken heart residue around my. Microwave. See, this is the kind of information you can't get on just any podcast that's right you heard it here first <laughs> <laughs> all right well we're at we're at right at about an hour here um nick I, i'm so glad i stumbled onto you or i was served you up on social media because you're a fun follow are there other ways people can uh, follow and connect with you um mostly just twitter right now as where i'm active you know if if you're the kind of person who would like a 26 year old med student blabbing to you about, you know, the new paper in nature biomedical engineering for five minutes on YouTube. And you can check on my YouTube. Otherwise, you know, Twitter is where I'm at. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope to become more active on more social media platforms, especially in your online. spare time. Right. Right now it's a little bit, a little busy. I think <laughs> have six papers on my plate right now with like medical school and then some projects I'm running and two research topics I'm editing. And I absolutely need to find time to watch House of the Dragon. That is not a compromise. So that came huh. out right? the Game of Thrones spinoff. I'm a big fan, big fan. Huh. So um, anyway, yeah, life is good. Life is busy. I wouldn't have it any other way. I yeah. have so, I have so many comments I could make and I'm, <laughs> I'm, re I'm refraining. There's no spoilers. 
<laughs> Bill? All, all I have to say is keep up the great work, Nick. Um, like I said, you're giving us you're giving us all hope for the uh, future. Absolutely. And uh, I think this is how this is how change happens. So uh, keep up the great work. We look forward to probably talking to you again sometime uh, when you have like 20 more papers out, um, which will be next week or two. Right, I was going to say next yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Pleasure. Well, all right. Well, uh, for Dr. Philip Ovedia, I'm Jack Heald. This has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Our guest today was uh, Dr. PhD. I'm not sure if I call you a doctor yet. I don't, I'm not that, that guy, Nick Norwitz. I don't uh, care. Nick, all Nick his Nick. contact information will be available on the show notes. I'd like our listeners. Uh, everything is now, uh, we're also video. So we've got a YouTube channel. All of that information is available. Like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. You know how to do it. And we'll talk to you next time. America is fat and sick and tired. 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and at risk of a sudden heart attack. Are you one of them? Go to ifixhearts.co and take Dr. Ovedia's metabolic health quiz. Learn specific steps you can take to reclaim your health, reduce your risk of heart attack, and stay off Dr. Ovedia's operating table.